Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thanks, Sherry, and thank you, Global Patties. You know, each week we get to talk about how much we appreciate our sponsor support, and we know you'd rather we get right to talking about beekeeping. However, our great sponsors are critical to help making all of this happen. From the transcripts, the hosting fees, the software, the hardware, the microphones, the subscriptions, the recorders, they enable each episode. So with that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us. We're really happy you're here. Before we get started, just a quick reminder to subscribe or follow Beekeeping Today podcast and give us a five-star rating. It really does help. Also, we are now adding complete transcripts of each episode on the website after the show notes. Check them out. You can also leave questions and comments online under each show. You can leave a comment, ask a question, reply to a question, ours or our listeners. Click on leave a comment at the top of the episode's show notes to join the discussion. Have you listened to an episode and thought, that person sounds really interesting? and I'd like to know more about them. Well, now you can. Each episode links to a guest profile. Each profile has a guest photo, bio, contact information, including Instagram and Twitter details if they have them. Check it out. And finally, share the podcast with your beekeeping friends, email them links, or mention it at your next beekeeper meeting. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We are glad you are here. I can't believe it is nearly the middle of September already. It seems like only a week ago I was putting supers on the hives, and now... I'm finishing taking them off and preparing the colonies for fall and that, should I say, the W time of year. Fall is a time when you want to inspect your colonies, check the varroa mite levels, and treat accordingly. I strongly suggest you use the Honey Bee Health Coalition's Varroa Management Guide to help you decide which treatment modality to follow based on your own management approach. (laughs) And that's a sneak preview to next week's episode. Do you treat with apistant or specifically the chemical amitraz? If so, you might want to listen to this week's episode of Dr. Kirsten Trainer's Two Million Blossoms podcast. In the episode, she talks with Dr. Adrian Fisher about his research on the effects of amitraz on drone larva sperm development and viability. Does the residual amitraz in beeswax really have an impact on drone sperm development and therefore the productivity of queens? Listen to the episode at www w.2millionblossoms.com, and that's with the number two. We have a really good show for you today with Dr. Mark Winston, who recently retired as a professor and senior fellow at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, British Columbia. Mark is a leading expert of honeybees and has written extensively about them, including in his award-winning book, Bee Time, Lessons from the Hive. Mark has a unique and poetic writing style that will pull you into his world and vision of just how important honeybees are to us all. If you get only one book this year on honeybees, I suggest you consider Bee Time, Lessons from the Hive. We'll be hearing from Mark directly, but first, a quick word from our friends at Strong Microbials. Hello, beekeepers. Your honeybees face a lot of challenges out there. Unbalanced food sources from monoculture crops holding yards, drought, food shortages, antibiotics, pesticides, and pathogens like chalk brood. To overcome these challenges, your bees need the multiple bacteria that are in all nectars, pollens, and the environment. These bacteria aid honeybees' digestion and improve your honeybees' response and resilience to pesticides. Now you can help improve your honey colony health 
with a quick, easy, and safe to use product. Strong Microbial's Super DFM Honeybee uses naturally occurring bacteria to restore the healthy gut biome of your honeybees. Check them out today at www.strongmicrobials.com. And while you're on the Strong Microbial site, make sure you click on and subscribe to The Hive, their regular newsletter full of interesting beekeeping facts and product updates. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the show. Sitting across the virtual Zoom table right now is Mark Winston from Simon Fraser University up in the Vancouver, BC area. Many of you may know Mark from all of his writings, and we'll get into all that. Mark, welcome to the show. Such a pleasure to be here. It's good to see you again, Mark. It's been too long. Jeff, you probably remember Mark wrote for Bee Culture for, I guess it was about 10 years, way back when, when he was getting started and I was getting started there. And he did a great column. And I was sorry to see him go. But when he finally left, he took off in a lot of different directions. And well, first off, tell me what you did when you first started at Simon Fraser. You were doing just basic bee research, right? Yes, when I first started at SFU, you know, I came out of the job as a bee researcher, but I was very fortunate to be taken under the wing of a couple of guys here in Canada, John Corner, the former provincial apiculturist, and Cam Jay, a professor at the University of Manitoba. And they took me all around the country, introduced me to beekeepers, and they reminded me that bees are a wonderful entry point into science, into basic biology, but also into agriculture and into the applications. And so right from day one, my lab was invested in doing the kind of basic research that we're expected to do at university, but also I and my students were constantly out in the beekeeping community, hearing what beekeepers needed, doing research for beekeepers, going to beekeeping meetings, giving talks, and from that, getting more involved in the whole uh, spectrum of agriculture. So we started off in kind of that multi-pronged way. Yeah, you got a good start, and then you decided it was time to write some books. I've got them all sitting here. I have no idea how I did that, because looking back on it, (laughs) uh, writing a book is a huge undertaking. And between running a lab, having a family, doing some other things in the community that I lived in, and I have no idea where I found the time to write books. But the first book I wrote was The Biology of the Honeybee. Still, to my amazement, still sells you know a thousand copies a year. Very outdated, but also the only book out there that covers honeybee biology. It wasn't until I wrote that book that I really had a sense of the full spectrum of what we knew about honeybees. And I think at that time, the amount we knew was limited enough that one person could grasp it. I don't think today that there is one person who could actually cover all of honeybee biology because the knowledge we have has exploded. And writing of that book, I guess it got the writing bug going because I've written six books since then, some about bees, some about agriculture, pest management, some about genetically modified crops. But the first book I wrote, Biology of Honeybee, was what really got me rolling in the writing direction. Is that something that you plan on updating? No. People ask me this a lot, because it really desperately needs to be updated. And I kind of been fishing around for somebody who might want to take on updating the book, but uh, had no luck so far, because it's such a massive undertaking. You know, that book was inspired by a book from about 1961 by a fellow named Ronald Ribbons, who wrote a book called, it might have been called The Social Behavior of the Honeybee, or something like that. And it came out in the early 60s. He was a British bee scientist who worked for the government agency in England and was tragically killed in a car crash. But it's a beautifully written book, very readable, fascinating and that was my template. I thought, you know, Ribbons wrote this book in 61. Now it's the mid-1980s. It's time for another person to write it. And I used his approach of, let's try to make this a readable book as well, not, not too academic. I'm really hoping somebody picks up the torch and carries that on and either updates my version or writes their own. It's a great well, book. Well, that won't be me. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I at, at our age, we kind of look at writing a book and think, you know, let's let some of the younger people do that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Some of the topics you covered in your books so are, I'm going to say, relatively timeless. The one I'm referring to, I think it's your last one, Listening to the Bees, Bee Time. That that one, I'm pretty close to being right when I say timeless. You hit on all of the things that make beekeeping what it is to the people who love to do it. Yeah, those are actually, there were two books, Bee Time, that came out in 2014, and then 
the book Listening to Bees, a set of essays that I co-wrote with a poet, Renee Saragini Sakvakar. And the two of them together, I think, stand as twin pillars, what you might call a love letter to the bees. I had gotten to a point in my life where I was starting to think about legacy and, you know, have a little more time to reflect on things I've done and what's happened. And I just really realized how deeply, how profoundly working with bees and beekeepers has affected me. I've become a lot more collaborative and a much better listener, uh, much more able to slow down and really listen to nature around me, but also to people. And also a lot more concerned about what's happening to bees. And those things all came together into uh, Bee Time and then the book I came out with a couple of years ago, Listening to the Bees. And I would say, yes, they're timeless. I think they touch to that, that thing about bees, not only honeybees, but wild bees as well. The thing about bees that just really seems to attract people, not just beekeepers, but there's so much interest in bees. They're just such a unbelievably interesting and significant and environmentally important set of organisms. So in that way, I think the book will, like biology, the honeybee, you know, eventually it goes out of date. But bee time, listening to the bees, I think those will be with us for a long time. Yeah, like I said, timeless, I think pretty much. Went back and looked quick at both of them, and that was the word that came up after about a minute and a half of reviewing both of them again. Going back a few years before that, though, you were looking at some stuff that was fairly controversial, and I'm thinking mostly about nature wars and the pesticide problem, and, and wonder what your thoughts are. Uh, that came out, I want to say, 99 or so, and so that's back about 10, 12 years has it gotten better? Has it gotten worse, the situation? I think our situation in agriculture in general has gotten worse rather than better. Pesticide impacts are increasing. I am one of those in the camp who believes that one of the most significant factors in the current decline of honeybees and wild bees has been pesticide impact. And not just from one pesticide, but from the thousand little cuts that we get from the many pesticides that are used out in fields by farmers, but also by beekeepers. Beekeepers have become just as guilty of overusing chemicals as the farm community that we used to used to decry their excessive pesticide use. And now we, we seem to have gotten sucked into the same pattern. Agriculture has gotten bigger, if anything, more monocrops, more lack of diversity in fields. I'd say since Nature Wars came out, the situation has become even more acute. I think I have to agree with that. I have a thing about putting poison in a beehive and the choices that you have to maintain and to continue as a beekeeper, are they're tough to make. After some of this, you went on then, and you went to work for the Morris Wasp Center for Dialogue. And that's when you kind of, I'm not going to say drifted away from bees and beekeeping, but you became less visible to people like me. And the work you did there was it wasn't how to harvest honey, that's for sure. You know, it's interesting. A lot of journalists, when I, I've asked you that question, how does the guy who works with bees end up being the founding director of a center for dialogue? I've really thought about that a lot because it doesn't feel that different to me than what I used to do. And I think there's really two uh, two connectors between the my past bee life and my more current life in the center for dialogue. One is that bees are highly collaborative and highly communicative. And spending so much time with my head inside of a beehive really helped me to appreciate the importance of collaborating across the wide spectrum of perspectives and opinions we have in our world. And also about the importance of honest and direct communication under many channels. I mean, bees are constantly dialoguing with each other, transferring information and making decisions about what to do. These tiny bees, you know, depending on what they hear. And the other thing was a little more human. During my time in the beekeeping community, I got quite involved in a lot of controversies, and they spilled over into agriculture, pesticide stuff, controversies about how agriculture was done. Then I got interested in genetically modified crops and their impacts on bees, and through that, I wrote another book about how we communicate to each other, how we humans communicate about issues, and how debate was not getting us to the places we needed to go. And all those things came together for me with when our university built a building, the Morris J. Watt Center for Dialogue, but they didn't have any idea of programming to uh, put into it. And so I asked and was granted the opportunity to work down there, both teaching students, but also doing a lot of public outreach work, taking 
the difficult issues of the day going well beyond bees and agriculture and finding a different way to talk about them. In that way, I think it's quite connected to my earlier career. Different topic, but it's always been the same basic idea of how can we talk to each other better? How can we listen to each other better? How can we understand and accept diverse perspectives and still find a way to move forward on uh, difficult issues? Well, there's a lot of people who could use some background <laughs> in that right now in the world, I'm thinking. <laughs> uh, yes. Maybe we should dig. <laughs> it's not going away. <laughs> we should be digging it out and getting that information back to some of the people running the show here. That's for well, sure. Well, there's a lot of things that you did in that center, the things that you were teaching people, and you kind of just touched on basically what communication probably is. Everything comes in second after that. By doing that, you've won a lot of awards in your world, and I'm not familiar with those in terms of where they come from and why you were given them. Do you want to take a look at some of those? I hardly ever uh, talk about my awards. I'm a bit, uh, <laughs> a bit embarrassed to, to bring it up. I'd say a lot of them have to do with science communication. Part of my career has involved not only my joy, but also obligation of feeling that scientists need to do a better job of communicating with the public. But I've done a lot of teaching and mentoring around that. And of course, my own communication in the books and the articles I wrote in mean, the 10 years of bee culture is a great example. You know, those were articles written by scientists that I would argue were eminently approachable by anybody at any education level and any background, because that was important to me. That and I think we all should work hard to make sure we can communicate. So a lot of the awards had to do with the work I spent with science communication. Bee Time won the Governor General's Literary Award for nonfiction, which is, I don't know, in the U.S., but it's a pretty big deal in Canada. And it was kind of the same thing. You know, it was an award for my writing that involved taking topics that could be difficult to approach and writing about them in a way that could really resonate with the public. There's one other award I want to mention, actually, just popped into my head. Nature Wars, the book you mentioned earlier about pests and pesticides, it won the Sterling Award for Controversy. And that was actually a, that was a really important moment for me because I didn't think it was a very controversial book. It was pretty well balanced. You know, it talked about pesticides, but not, you know, critically, but I wouldn't say it was a rant. And the pesticide industry was really angry because they thought it was anti-pesticides. But environmentalists were also, some of them were also angry because they thought it was too soft on pesticides and too interested in genetically modified crops. It won the award because it got attacked on both sides. It won the award for being a book that was well-balanced and well-reasoned and well-thought-through and not a rant. And I thought, wow, if that's what's controversial in our society, we need a center for dialogue to really kind of figure out how we're going to talk to each other. So that, that award was actually another thing that got me going with, with the Morris J. Watt Center. Let's take this quick opportunity to hear from one of our sponsors, Better Be. Hey, podcast listeners, here's what we've been waiting for all year long. It's time to harvest and extract the honey. When you're ready to bottle and sell your crop, head over to betterbee.com. There you can shop for custom honey labels and glass or plastic honey containers. As your partners in better beekeeping, Better Bee does all the work of figuring out the weight each honey container will hold not just the standard water weight or volume measure. So you can choose from the classics or go bold and different with a great selection of uniquely designed bottles. Check out our 50-plus container options and order with confidence at BetterBee.com. Mark, I didn't mean to embarrass you and make you talk about specific awards, but I really, really wanted you to kind of bring out even more on the value of communication. I think I can safely say there's hardly any communication going on in the world at the moment. Unfortunately, people, are, you're either this or that, and you're not any, there isn't much in between. So what you've done is two things. One is you've pointed out the value of good communication, and then you've shown what can occur when you do it right. So I'm hoping people take that away from this message, is that take a half step back and listen instead of yelling all of the time. One of the other things that I wanted to bring up was the fact that you're stepping down. Yes, I am retiring from the day we're recording today. I'm retiring in, in one week. I'm retiring at the end of August this year. Big plans? Any plans? Some plans? I, having recently done the same thing, have found it to be quite confusing. How's that for simple? <laughs> 
Yeah. You know, I think I'm coming out of, I've, I've effectively been retired for a bit of time. Things really slowed down in my world because of COVID. And I just let that kind of slide down towards retirement. And while well, it's going to be official at the end of August, I'm also really slowed down since then. It's given me pause to think about what I want to do. And I realized that the things that I did were exactly the things that I love to do. I love to write. I love to teach. I love talking to people. And I love the opportunity to help other people with their own communication. So I think I'll continue doing a bit of that. I mentor writers in a program that I'm involved in and occasionally teach a writing course for the public and things like that. And I'll probably do a project or two at the Center for Dialogue. So people do a little bit of a level of work, but I am honestly comfortable with the idea of spending a typical day getting up in the morning, reading the newspaper, going out for coffee with a friend, taking a walk or having a swim, coming back and reading another book, maybe watching a Toronto Blue Jays game. I've become a big fan of the Blue Jays. And my wife and I are, you know, we, we really get along. I just love being in her proximity. She's just the warmest, kindest, sweetest person you could imagine. And even just sitting around being in a room with her is kind of makes my day. So I've come to terms with the idea that I'm no longer needing to accomplish a lot of stuff. And I can do a few things here and there, but mostly just smelling the roses. And if I get tired with that, I imagine I'll pick up some projects. But at the moment, I'm really thinking, yeah. Oh, and the grandkids. Don't want to forget the grandkids. You know, that's, uh, <laughs> they don't live near us. We have to travel to see them. But spending time with the grandkids is another real joy. Well, I don't have grandkids, but uh, that reading the paper in the morning and a cup of coffee and a swim, I've actually watched more baseball in the last year than I have in my whole entire life up until last year. So that's been a strange discovery for me. But well, Tom, but it sounds like you've got this kind of figured out. Should be an enjoyable time. I guess I have to say, what have we missed that you want to say? You know, it's interesting you're talking about baseball because I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, outside of Cleveland. I was a big Indians fan when I was growing up, and I loved watching baseball. And then, you know, I got busy with things, moved to Boston, became a basketball fan, watched the Boston Celtics. And, you know, when I moved to Canada in 1980, I became a big hockey fan. But hockey is a very different game than baseball. It's really hard hitting <laughs> and fast paced. Now that I'm retiring, I find baseball just suits me to a T. It's slow. It takes three or four hours. Every game has a story. You know, it's not just the sport. Sport is, is it's about story. You get to know the players. Things happen that you've never seen before. And it kind of reminds me of sticking my head into a beehive. You know, I open a beehive. Time slows down for me. And my senses are all on alert. I'm really much more aware of what's happening. And I think baseball is like that, too. It's a slow game, but when you learn to appreciate it, it's just really a pace that allows you to go deep and really understand the small and subtle things that really drive our world. And so I think baseball fits in quite well with my, uh, if I'm not going to spend time in the apiary, then I'll spend any time watching baseball. seems just about seems pretty similar. Where in the Cleveland area did you grow up? I'm originally from Cleveland area, Lakewood. Oh, you know. Yeah, yeah. I grew up in South Euclid. I can honestly remember. 2088 Campus Drive, Evergreen 28148 was my phone number. Why I remember that, I don't know. <laughs> and it was a great place to grow up. It was at the edge of the city at the time, although I know the city's expanded since then. And, you know, I get up in the morning, get on my bike, go out, walk around a lot of parks nearby, or I go to a community center and play with, you know, hang around with my friends. And maybe or maybe not, I'd come home at night for dinner. You know, it was that, it was that kind of a upbringing that, you know, all of us think. You know, maybe it doesn't happen to kids anymore, but that was my, you know, that was my upbringing, just going out. And then I read a lot of books. And when I wasn't biking around with my friends, I was reading books. And it was a great, it was a great place to grow up. Where was your part of Cleveland? I grew up in the Lakewood area. In oh, Lakewood. Lakewood right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And obviously I grew up at a time when the Indians were not winning. So I never really developed a fondness for baseball. <laughs> <laughs> uh, boy, when, when I was growing up, the Indians... Every year, it would come down to the Labor Day weekend series against the Yankees. And whoever won that series was going to go on to the playoffs of the World Series. And every year, the Indians would lose. It was, it was amazing. I did see one of the most profound moments in sports I've ever seen in my life watching the Indians. It was one of those games, you know, bottom of the ninth tie game. Minnie Minoso was on third base. And just out of the blue, he stole home. And I was sitting there. I was at the game, and I was watching it. I saw him steal home. 
and the Indians won. They went on to lose the next game or two and still didn't go to the World Series. But it was just one of those moments you never forget, you know, Minnie Minoso stealing home. The only thing I can think of is I was at one of the last games at the old municipal stadium. So that was kind of thinking that that's no longer there and now they have the Jacobs Stadium. So that was it's kind uh, of cool. You know, I'm a, a pretty progressive kind of guy and I'm really glad they changed the name from the Cleveland Indians. But Guardians? I mean, come on, what kind of name is that? Cleveland <laughs> Guardians? <laughs> I'm glad the name has changed. Boy, they, they need to think about changing it to something better. Well, that's the team I listen to. I'm not far from where you guys grew up in Medina, so that's the team I'm listening to. And I guess I don't have a feeling one way or other about the name, but listening to you talk about time slowing down when you're watching a baseball game, the other half of that is, at least for me, is you can do two things at once. You know, I'm good at reading the paper, and then and then I don't watch the other team bat so much as I do the the Cleveland team. And then when the Cleveland team comes up, I put the paper down and that's when I pay attention. But it's a lot like a beehive. You're exactly right. It's interesting. And the thing that you mentioned, you can be watching and it's slow and it's slow. And bang, something happens. I just got stung. And said, yes, yeah, that wakes you <laughs> right up, doesn't it? <laughs> yep. You know, it's, it's funny that I don't know if just being around bees accented and augmented parts of my personality or if they were all there to begin with, but I think I just genuinely feel I got involved in bees in 1975. Did a lot of things before that, but that was my first encounter with bees, and I was immediately felt like I had found my home. Like this was this was my organism. I I got it. I think bees really increased my natural tendency to collaborate. Really increased my interest in interaction with with people, but also with nature. It really helped me to slow down. You know, if you work really fast. A lot of commercial beekeepers will go in and out of an apiary, whip, whip in, whip out, and do their job. And that's, you know, that's one way to keep bees. But, you know, when you're doing research or you're more of a hobby beekeeper, it's really a time to slow it down. And it's spilled over into every aspect of my life. Like, people are always surprised at work when I used to go to work. My door is always open. And it always, to people, it seemed like there was nothing on my desk. And people would walk in, and I have lots and lots of time to talk. And I think I learned that from bees, that you spend a lot of your time, bees spend a lot of their time resting. They don't actually work as hard as we think. And I think some of that spilled over to me as well. I really learned the importance of resting and being available for whatever happens that uh, you might need to react to or benefit from. I am eternally grateful for whatever coincidences led me into the uh, beekeeping world. I've made such amazing friends in the human world. It's affected who I am so deeply. Gave me the opportunity to feel like I was doing something in the academic world that was of interest to and important to the rest of the world that I really was earning my pay. When I stepped down from bees and went to the Center for Dialogue, I thought I was done with bees. In fact, I gave a, a last talk at the Eastern Agricultural Society. And it was filmed by a Canadian show called The Nature of Things. It was doing a profile about my my life and my leaving bees. And on, you know, on camera for millions of people to watch, I just broke down. I was bawling my eyes out because it was such an emotional moment for me. And I'd left the bee culture writing behind as well. But I'm not I'm not done with bees. I still write about bees. I still, you know, don't give many talks anymore, but I'm still involved in the beekeeping world. And I realized that you don't really end, that there's still ways of staying involved even if you're not active in bee research. Bees are, uh, they're important to me. Just to remind our listeners that you are still writing for the bee culture and doing an occasional review. And other yes, articles? I, I, Kim was a fantastic editor. I don't mind telling you that, Kim. But he, uh, you, you know, he let me write what I wanted, said some controversial things. He never shut me down. There were one or two times when he would call me up and say, you know, you can publish this if you want, but it's actually not that good. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I actually appreciated that. You know, see, keeping me from embarrassing myself. And uh, the current editor, Jerry, uh, he's kindly agreed to let me publish a few pieces. I usually do reviews, book reviews or reviews of films, documentaries. Just did a thing on a, on a business in Alberta and how they were selling their honey. So, you know, it's, it's not the pressure of a monthly column, which can, you know, can be quite a bit better. Some of the, some of the writers for Bee Culture have been going for I don't know how many decades. And they still come up with new things to write. But I have the pleasure of writing occasionally without that pressure of a monthly column. Jeff, I don't know if you read any of Mark's reviews recently, but they're almost as long as the book he's reviewing. <laughs> so when you're done, you know more about the book than maybe even the author does, but they're quite well, and they dissect 
the parts of the book that are important. I enjoy reading them. Absolutely. I will admit my first exposure to your writing was Bee Time. And I found that very fascinating and really enjoyed the book. So I'm looking forward to exploring your other writings as well. I did like the poetic writing style that you have. It wasn't just all matter of fact. It flowed nicely. Yeah, I think I like to teach people about science communications. It's not all about the science. If there's no emotion in it, if there's no feeling, if there's no poetry, then we're missing a lot of the joy and wisdom that science can bring to us when we just limit it to the facts. And the last book I wrote, it'll probably be the last book I write, Listening to the Bees, that I co-wrote with a poet, really helped push me and my writing a little more in that poetic direction as well. I remember the end of that the end of listening to the bees, I write about my research group and how we used to go out and do, you know, I kind of tried to bring alive how it was to go out in the field early in the morning, do research. And then I end by kind of bringing back those moments of showing up at the apiary and lighting the smoker. And then the last line of the book is something like, you know, we open the lid of the first hive and it's still how I feel. You know, we, uh, there's still a lot of lids of hives to be opened in, in life and I guess, you know, coming back to your question about retirement, Kim, I think it may not be bees, but I still feel there's lots of lids to be opened, lots of things to learn, lots of people to talk to, and lots of joy to be uh, to be had in life. And, you know, my wife, Lori, we, from the day we met, we just walk and talk a lot. And Lori is one of these, I'm a, I'm a fast walker, I just like to walk. But Lori, she'll be walking and she'll suddenly stop, like absolutely stop still and notice something. And that's an image I like to keep keep in my mind about retirement too it's, you know just stopping and noticing what we're doing can bring you those joys and those moments that make retirement you know really particularly uh, a wonderful part of life take some time and smell the bee flowers eh <laughs> yes and, <laughs> while there's still bees to be seen let's take the time and notice them there you go well, Mark, we really appreciate you taking the opportunity to spend some time with us and, and reflection at the end of your your teaching career at the university level, but I'm sure you'll be out there teaching as you find time and, and want. I look forward to it. I may have some teaching left, but I still have a lot of learning to do, that's for sure. Don't we all? Yep. Well, it's been fun, Mark. I'm glad you could make it today. It has been a true pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, having me on the show. It was really fun having Mark finally on the podcast We've gone after him for a couple times, and it just never worked out. I guess it was meant to be that we can help him celebrate his retirement with this podcast. Yeah, it was good to catch up with him again. I, Like he said, I spent about 10 years working with him once a month for 100 and some articles, and every one of them was good, and he was easy to work with. And then I kind of kept up with him after he left with his books. I've managed to collect all of his books and get most of them read, so I stayed in touch his concept of bee time though probably is my most cherished memory of him because he he gets it exactly right when you take the top off a beehive and the world changes so it was good to have him on and catch up on what he's been doing and uh mark happy retirement yeah we'll celebrate that with you Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts, wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at globalpatties.com. Thanks to Strong Microbials for their support of this podcast. Check out their probiotic line at strongmicrobials.com. We want to thank Better Bee for their longtime support. Check out all their great beekeeping supplies at betterbee.com. Thanks to Northern Bee Books for their support of Bee Books Old New with Kim Flodham. Check out all of their books at northernbeebooks.co.uk. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on the show. Feel free to leave us comments and questions at leave a comment section under each episode on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot, everybody. 